Alrighty, I think we can uh, begin. So good evening and welcome to our West Orange Board of Education special public board meeting on this beautiful evening of May 20th, uh, 2021. Um, Welcome to our public. Uh, good evening to Dr. Cascon, my fellow members of the board, and uh, Ms. Flowers. And would you please do us the honor of a roll call? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Good evening, everyone. Roll call, please. Mrs. Greta? Present. Mrs. Merklinger? Here. Mr. Rothstein? Here. Vice President Tunnycliffe? Here. President Trick Scales. Here. Thank you. Please stand for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of, the of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, under, under God, God, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. all. Thank you, everyone. And um, this is a policy workshop this evening. We do have a few business items uh, to attend to. And moving right along on our agenda, uh, we will move to Dr. Cascone's report and board reports. Dr. Cascone. Thank you, President Trick Scales. And uh, good evening, uh, members of the board, colleagues, and and members of the public uh, who are in attendance with us this evening. Uh, yes, indeed, this is uh, principally a public policy work session. Um, uh, it's a relatively light docket. Uh, I would characterize it as sort of a housekeeping, largely a housekeeping meeting as we uh, get organized um, and kind of map out our timeline uh, in our efforts to uh, conclude the, uh, the revision and updating of the policy manual um, in advance of, uh, of next school year and uh, this summer. We do have some items uh, on the agenda for action. Um, most, I think there are two items which are noteworthy, um, particularly noteworthy. One is uh, the board and the public will see that uh, we are approving the, uh, the balance um, of our uh, planned and scheduled summer programs. Um, and the public can expect that tomorrow a communication will be coming from the curriculum office and it'll be kind of what I'm referring to as a one-stop shopping uh, you know document uh, containing links um, to those programs that um, have registration aspects to them and so we're um, you know I think the board will notice and public will notice from the attachments that it's a it's a um, rather rather uh, you know um, substantial number of programs in addition to the ones which were already approved um, so just wanted to call attention to that in the forthcoming communication from the curriculum office. Uh, also noteworthy is the revision to the school calendar, which um, I did communicate out to the community on Friday um, that we did adjust um, our give back days. Um, and we will uh, be having one of those on Friday, May 28th uh, to extend the Memorial Day weekend. And the second one will be applied to June 23rd, making the last day for students uh, June 22nd. So the revised school calendar is on the is on the agenda for the board's approval, and if approved, uh, would be communicated uh, out uh, tomorrow uh, to the community. Uh, we have a, a, a single policy uh, on the agenda for uh, consideration and adoption uh, by the board, and the others are just um, some items that were time sensitive and um, which uh, this public meeting for action represented a a timely opportunity to kind of get that business taken care of. So I appreciate the board's, um, uh, you know, uh, entertainment of these action items on what typically would just have been a, a work session meeting. Um, you know, the though um, we have some folks in attendance here tonight and, um, you know, and I, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit to uh, the communication that went out uh, this afternoon relative to the busing. Um, you know, and though we are relatively few in attendance tonight, Obviously, it will be televised, and so for those who wish to re to view it, 
um, subsequently they'll have, a, have that opportunity. You know, so so we talk about the you know the courtesy and the hazardous busing um, matter, which which has become um, had become um, you, you know kind of a um, high profile issue, if you will, within the community. And um, I think there are a few questions that bear answering. Of course, the community communication uh, did speak to them, but I think they're worth sort of touching upon again here in in the public meeting. Uh, and the first is, you know, where did we get the money? And in by golly, why didn't we use it sooner, right? So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the the monies that we that we're now using to fund those uh, previously cut courtesy and hazardous routes are essentially um, going to be funded out of uh, out of surplus. Um, so what does that mean? So at at the end of a fiscal year, a school district may be operating at a surplus or monies revenues that had been budgeted and that were not spent. The state allows a school district to um, carry over 2% of that surplus. Now, when it's carried over into the next fiscal year, it changes in terms of what it's called. It changes from surplus to fund balance. Now, there are two ways that a school district, uh, two general ways the school district can utilize fund balance. And Ms. Flowers, if at any point in time you, you wanna correct me, feel free. Um, if you feel that I'm, I'm, I'm off base, please. Um, there's two ways. One is that um, the fund balance can be carried over to essentially fund the next fiscal year budget um, to essentially um, subsidize, partially subsidize the next year's budget. The second way is that a district can take um, money from that fund balance um, and, util and, and put it into reserves. And, and as I've explained previously, there are three principal types of reserves, and those are capital reserves, a maintenance reserve, and emergency reserve. Now, historically in West Orange, um, we have not done that. Um, up until this year, we were not do, we were not carrying over any reserves. And why are reserves important? And why and why are they really more critical than you know simply what one might call a rainy day fund, right? Um, well, that's true in part. But let's talk about, for example, the Washington School Retaining Wall, just as an example. It's a one million dollar project. It's a project that most likely it's going to be very difficult for the district to fund out of the general fund and the operating budget for a fiscal year. If a district were diligent in its accumulation of reserves, that amongst other projects could be projects that could be funded and done out of capital reserve in a given year. In the absence of reserves and with the inability to do it out of the operating budget, that becomes something that the board would have no choice but to go out for a bond, uh, a referendum uh, to the community. To fund that, so that highlights um, the importance. Really, you know, breaking it down to the the household level or the individual level, it's the importance of having savings, which we know many Americans, uh, you know, um, you know, do not right. Um, and in fact, many households and individuals are operating on deficit spending. Our federal government, our state governments are horrifically in debt. Our nation, individual, we're a debtor nation, right? We're not able to do that on the local level as a school as a school district. We have to balance our budget. We cannot deficit spend. Hence, why savings become that much more uh, important. So we historically have not carried our fund balance into reserves. We've used it entirely. Um, I would argue that when you look historically back over the last ten years and the budget that the West Orange has passed, even within the two percent cap, it's actually what has enabled the district to be able to pass budgets under 2%. In the absence of that additional, let's call it $2 million of revenue, that $2 million of revenue would have had to come from the tax levy. Now, some would consider that a good thing, but we're sort of stealing from Peter to pay Paul. The end game is that we're, we're using as little fund balance as possible to balance our budget and as much as possible going into reserves that we're building up over time and using, using for those critical needs, including emergent needs that might come up over the course of the year. In fact, that came to fruition this year. The first year in quite some time that we carried over reserves, we ended up needing a portion of those. Um, we would have needed more if it weren't for the ESSER 1 and the ESSER, more really the ESSER 1 grant um, that we were able to pull from for some of our needs. We're not going to be able to count on those kinds of funds moving forward, either ESSER 1 or ESSER 2. So if you notice the letter, it talked about or it referenced the, the business department's budget goals for 20. 2020-21. And one of those goals was to reduce fund balance used to balance the budget. 
So part of the of, of doing that within this budget was in alignment with the goals that had been set earlier in the school year. I, you know, I, I feel comfortable standing behind that decision, but that raises the next question, right? And, and perhaps the one that's a little bit more, as I said in the letter, a little bit more nuanced to answer. And that's well, why in the heck did, if you needed to do that, why the heck did you cut that of all things, right? Um, you know, I think the reality of it is, is that, you know, this board and this administration were very, and one might say myopically focused uh, on trying to preserve our programs, whether they be academic, extracurricular, social, emotional, mental health, whatever the case may be. Um, in the absence of uh, perhaps some historical knowledge, in the absence of, you know, any feedback from the community like that, which we received for some of the positions that we had proposed cutting. And let me just pause for a moment and say, I'm not saying that as a criticism to the public. Rather, I would say that it's a learning moment for the board and the administration moving forward in successive budgets is that being better at predicting, understanding which cuts are going to be controversial um, or problematic, being explicit about those and doing that in a timely fashion so that whatever feedback we get, we get it in time to have it potentially impact the decision making. Um, and that, to me, is a, is a big takeaway from this. Um, but when, um, you know, when I look at what's occurred over the, the last several days, you know, when you peel back some of the angst and the anger and, you know, you know understandable, it's not my place to judge people's emotions. Um, I think there's actually a lot to be pleased about. I think there's a, a lot to celebrate what we've seen, what's happened in the last several days. What's happened? Um, well. We've seen a community unify, right? Galvanize around a topic. Um, we've seen a community passionately advocate for something that's important to them, right? And you've seen a board and an administration listen and in a relatively quick time, uh, respond and fix it. Now, um, can we vow and, and commit to having our process be more efficient and effective 100%? But at the end of the day, the end game that we all ultimately wanted came to pass. And I think that's on which we should focus. But that advocacy, that passion, um, is that which has made this school district great over the years. And it's what guarantees that it will be great moving forward. Um, so, you know, there, 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 are, there are plenty of lessons to learn. Um, I, I think when you, and, and I, I can, I don't, I'm not speaking for the board, I'm more speaking about the board, and then of course myself and the administration is, is that um, you have a group of people here who, who are earnest. You know, we're, we're, we are genuinely committed to doing what, what's in the best interest of kids whenever possible. Um, we're a group of people who are committed to getting better every day. Um, and we're, you know, we're a group of people that I would argue maybe to a, maybe to a fault internalize our mistakes, right? Um, but while that may be bad for us on some level, it's good for the community because what it guarantees the community is that we're not, we're not going to get complacent. We're not going to forget about our lessons. We're going to apply them moving forward and continue to get better. But the takeaway is a community that cares, a community that advocates, and a board and an administration that are going to listen and are going to respond and do the right thing ultimately. Um, so um, that's just a, a few thoughts um, relative to that that matter. And again, as I communicated, those roots have been restored. And, and and you know we will have to confront you know our larger financial issues moving forward. You know, um, but we've made safe harbor, if you will, port in the storm um, for now. And um, we can get back to focusing on the work at hand, and there's plenty to do. Um, final point is, you know, the, the great thing about you know, this isn't like a like a sports season where your team has a terrible year, and you're like, well, we can only hope for better next year. But you have to wait six months before you get to see whether that actually happens. Good news about this is, the season never ends. So tonight, tomorrow, forthcoming decisions, forthcoming processes, you get to see in real time the degree to which this board and this administration are going to learn and are going to um, improve um, and become more effective and efficient in the way we do business. And um, that, uh, President Trick Scales, is my uh, report for this evening.
Thank you, Dr. Cascone. I, I think that we may be having some trouble with folks. Um, oh, is that right? Getting to our meeting. Yes, uh, we've gotten some information that the link doesn't seem to be working. Oh. Um, I asked uh, Ms. Mendez if she would check the. Oh, okay. That's not good. Um, I actually um, am trying. Ms. Mendez, uh, let right, me I know. I just tried it and it said the as, same thing. Okay. Well, can you read me? Um, Hang on, Cookie. Um, I'm talking to Cookie, trying to trying to figure okay. out what's going on. It was working because we have 21 people here, but I tried it on a separate computer, and Cookie just tried it, and it's not working now. So I'm not sure what is going on. So just if you'll give me one minute, she's gonna see if she can help me. Thank you. By the way, Ms. Tr Ms. Tr President Trick Scales, you know, feel free to just butt in and tell me to, 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 to clam up at the. Well, <laughs> you'll you'll just have to do it again. That's all. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if I can just interrupt, um, I'm just getting some notes from folks that they had to try a few different of the board of ed sites that it was taking them to the six ten meeting, um, hmm. but they were able to finally find it. Um, with, uh, and I just sent, Terry, I just sent you the web ID and password if you wanna share that with uh, folks. I can't see the whole thing. It came in really oh. large. <laughs> okay. Um, so the web the webinar ID is 854-7578-2113. And then the password is 174982. And thank you to the folks that sent me that info. Yes, thank you. And Cookie is um, trying to fix it so that people will just be able to click on the link and not have to add that information, put the information in from Ms. Merklinger manually. Um, so I will put um, in the chat when I hear from her so that you guys know, but if you want to continue um, as well, hopefully we'll have an answer in a minute. Thank you so much uh, for the intervention. Um, great. All righty, so we'll go ahead and do um, board reports and we'll start with Ms. Huerta. Oh, I'm unmuted already. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Cascone. Um, thank you, uh, President Trigg Scales um, and to all the colleagues here. Um, don't really have much, um, but the PR committee is working on improving uh, communications, engagement, and being proactive in how we get constructive criticism from our community. Um, there has been a lot of concern uh, raised about the pedestrian safety in West Orange in general. And so there is going to be a pedestrian safety advisory board meeting on June 9th at 7.30 at the Edison Museum. Um, I think that this particular um, advisory board doesn't get as much, um, you know, it's much people involved and engaged. And I think it's really important. Um, they just recently got a grant to help uh, fix a couple of uh, concerns at, in the Washington, around Washington Elementary School. I forgot what they call it, the Washington Corridor, I believe it's called. Um, and so that's great news, but there's definitely a lot more work to be done. So um, thank you to the community for, uh, advocating for things that are important to them. Thank you, Ms. Huerta. And um, Ms. Merklinger? Um, yeah, just, you know, reiterate what, um, what Melinda just mentioned about um, PR committee um, working hard. Um, from the town council liaison, um, obviously we're gonna be setting up some time with Ms. Castellino, um, particularly in light of um, the busing. Um, and we do thank everyone for their advocacy and, and feedback. Um, but that's definitely, you know, definitely um, something that we'll be looking at with the town council. Um, and then obviously we have the policy workshop uh, coming up after this. So that's it for now. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Tony Cliff. Um, I don't really have any a formal report tonight, but I'll give one at the uh, next board meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Rothstein. Yeah, also likewise, since tonight is a, a policy workshop, um, 
uh, not much for me to say on policy right now, but when we get to that point later on in the uh, uh, in the agenda, there will be more to say. Great. Uh, did we just get a message? I missed that. Um, I guess everyone that's on is fine. It's those that aren't on yet that we need to get the word out to. So yes. I'm not quite sure so, how to do that. Um, and yeah. the, the problem is, is we don't know how to get, we need to get it on the website, which Cookie and I don't have rights to oh. uh, uh, do. And we don't have admin rights to, well, I don't have any rights to the Facebook. So I'm gonna, I am gonna reach out to Perry Bashkoff and see if I can get him on the phone and at least get the information um, posted there so that, People know we're not trying to keep them out. Um, I know. We definitely <laughs> don't want that impression. It's not in, it's, you know, and the link is working. Um, I mean, the link has the right information. We don't know why it's pointing to the June mm. meeting. It's very strange. Um, Cheryl, just for ease so that I can get it to Perry, can you type that information into the chat for me and I will get it over to him? Thank you. All right, so I'm, I'm going to do a few announcements and in this way we are um, pushing in a little time until some other folks can join us before we get to the business portion. So um, I had the pleasure of attending the book talk that was sponsored um, by Miss Lisa Tussaud, the library media specialist at Liberty and her colleagues. It was an author visit with Miss Julie Lee and middle school students. Um, and Miss Lee shared her family's personal experiences in her book entitled My Brother's Keeper. And it chronicles her mother and her uncle, actually their journey from North Korea to South Korea and all the trials and tribulations mm. that they encountered. Uh, we were all riveted by the presentation. And it, this, of course, is in celebration of um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I, I just want to thank the staff for making that happen. And I wish that there was some way that we could share it with um, a larger population. And again, the name of the book is My Brother's Keeper. And I wanted to congratulate um, the new Dr. William Farley uh, the music director and teacher extraordinaire at West Orange High School. Um, our community may know him best for his work as advisor and director of our lauded Jubilee Choir and award-winning boys step team, Absolute. And so congratulations to the new Dr. Farley. Ms. Drake Scales? Yes. Since, since we're acknowledging new doctors, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, you know, uh, Dr. Leslie Chung uh, of the high school assistant principal, um, and this is a few months ago, but oh. uh, we have we have another another doctoral, another doctor at the high school. So, oh, we're just getting smarter and smarter. So, congratulations to Dr. Leslie Chung, assistant principal at West Orange High School. So that's wonderful. And then I'd also like to congratulate uh, Miss Deborah Balthazar who is a substitute science teacher at Roosevelt Middle School, but we also know her as the reporter who covers all of our stories for Tap Into Net, um, all of our board meetings. And um, she's been named the inaugural NYU recipient of the Ann O'Hara McCormick Memorial Fund Scholarship for Journalism. And uh, I nice. just wanna congratulate uh, Deborah. Um, she's moving on to, wonderful heights and and she cut her teeth right here in west orange so congratulations to deborah all right so we picked up five more people so that's a good thing we're, we're getting there slowly but surely and i just wanted to make a statement about um the whole process that this board and the administration has gone through but mostly um, from the board's perspective and so um, this has been a year like no other, and, and we all know that. And being a board member during this time has, has been uh, certainly exceptional. None of us signed on um, to be at the helm as we waded through the waters of a pandemic. 
but we've really, really done our best. Our intentions have been very noble. Um, and we have had to go back and make some changes and some adjustments. And so you can say a lot of things about this board, but you can't say that we're not responsive and that we don't listen to our community. And so I said that the board has been uh, contested, protested, and based on some of the social media posts and emails, even detested. But what's true is that in adversity, through adversity, um, the best in people rises and sometimes the worst also rises. But we've learned um, many lessons. And as we look forward, um, we just wanted to let the community know again that we had our town hall, our budget town hall, and that was our effort to really, really get input from the community before we started the budget process. Hindsight tells us that we didn't do enough publicity. Um, we need to figure out another way to get the community's input. And so that's one of the lessons that we learned. Another lesson is that this board, with their good intentions, um, we were really, really sensitive to the financial impact of the pandemic. And we, we really hunkered down and said that we did not want to increase the tax levy um, beyond the 1.5, which is where we came in, the cap. So the lesson learned here is that what we did in the process was we forced Dr. Cascone and the administration to look for efficiencies and cuts in the budget if we could go back, we would probably redo that, but you don't get to redo budgets and caps. And so as we move forward, we just want the community to know that we are here, we are listening, we are trying our best. Um, we strive for perfection, no one's perfect. We're striving for it and um, we thank you again for your advocacy all along the way. Um, some was a bit more constructive than others, but we do appreciate that you're passionate about the West Orange Public Schools. And so we thank you very much. All right, so how are we doing? Oh, we're up to 44. So I think we can move into some business uh, questions from the public on agenda items so first just so um you are aware that is now there's a pop-up on the the website homepage with a new link and the webinar id and passcode and perry bashkoff is putting it up on social so hopefully people will will get it um and we still don't know what happened but cookie was able to fix it because she's magic and awesome <laughs> um, on that note um if you have comments on agenda items only so this would be um the uh curriculum and instruction finance miscellaneous um and the board policy this is not on any um other topic that will come after uh at the end you may raise your hand uh when i call your name you will unmute yourself um the timer is for three minutes it'll flip when i hit play state your name and address for the record lauren weinshank you may unmute yourself and state Hi. your name and address for the record lauren weinshank six curry lane can you hear me i'm at the track meet so yes can you hear me okay, can. okay great <laughs> great um very simple tonight i want to say thank you as someone who was very critical throughout the entire year and very critical about the busing i do have to agree with president trick scales you guys are nothing but responsive every single email has been responded to and i really appreciate that and i was very very happy to see the email today and thank you thank you for the hard work as this issue really did galvanize the community and bring us back together after a very difficult year that's it Thank you. Um, and that is it, Ms. Trig Scales, on public comment. 
Thank you very kindly. All right, so moving right into our business section, reports, discussions, and recommendations. I am calling for a motion for personnel. Item one, attachment one, curriculum and instruction. Item one, attachment two, item two, attachment three. And I think I'll stop there and I'll pick up finance separately. So is there a motion for um, personnel and curriculum and instruction? So moved. Thank you, Vice President Tony Cliff. Is there a second? Yes, seconded. Thank you, Mr. Rothstein. Any discussion on those items? Um, I did want to just ask about, um, and I, th I think Dr. Cascone might have answered it, but I just want to confirm. So all of the curriculum and instruction summer programs, are those going to be a registration or is it going to be like an, applic an application or is it going to be an invite from the guidance counselors or how right. is this going to work for each of these programs? Could you give us a little uh, color on that? Sure. Um, there, it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid if you'll pardon the expression. Um, there are on the document um, that goes home, the brochure, if you will, um, any program that has a link is a registration based program, meaning it's open to anyone. Um, programs that don't have registration links are are, are programs uh, where students either by virtue of uh, being in a specialized population uh, and or having been um, identified as a student who could benefit from the opportunity um, uh, would be, you know, contacted by the guidance counselor. Um, so it's, it, it'll be both, but it'll be, it'll be obvious by virtue of which ones have the links and which ones don't. Oh, okay. And what, what's the time frame for the parents to be notified I'm, of uh, their student needing to take uh, some of these courses over the summer? Right. So um, uh, is Mr. Mendez still on? I am. I, you, I mean, I, I could probably uh, fiddle around with that one and, and get it pretty much right, but why not go to the source? Sure. So, um, Ms. Tuncliff, there are some programs um, that are by invite, and those would be students who have been identified based on their performance or um, uh, mm -hmm. their uh, grades, uh, if they need credit recovery, depending um, if they're at the high school. Uh, the registration for programs that are open to all students, there will be a link on the brochure mm -hmm. uh, that will uh, enable parents to click. Mr. Mendez, yes? I, I covered that. I, I'm, see, I'm going to do what Ms. Trick Scales didn't do to me. Mr. Mendez, <laughs> um, can, you, can you key in specifically on the piece of, um, right, so I'm, a, stu I'm a, a basic skills student. I've been identified as someone who would, who, who would benefit from this program. When might my, my, my parents, guardians or caretakers be made aware that I've been identified for this program? We're starting next week. Next week, okay. okay. For elementary, you gave basic skills as an example. Right. The high school has a different time frame. Middle school has a different time frame, but the brochure will list um, when the registration opens, when it closes, and when it's due. And the brochure is coming out next week? Uh, it should be out or... by tomorrow or Monday. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Mm. Thank you. We're shooting for tomorrow, though, right? Mr. Yes, we're shooting for tomorrow. Uh, we just want to make sure we have all of the links active. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Mendez. Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion on A and B? There being oh. none, uh, Mrs. Oh, Flowers. I just, oh, sorry, oh, Mr. Right. Yeah, sorry, I was a little slow to the mute button there. Um, just had a question about the uh, the project adventure um, in attachment number two. Um, I, I assume that the um, the teacher attending would bring back um, uh, some learnings to the department to, to the physical education department in the school. I was just curious: is there anything that that uh, that we're planning in terms of, uh, uh, like that we know that would be added to the school program as a result of the attendance there, or is that sort of open-ended based on, on what's presented? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'll, um, uh, that's a great question, right? Um, so what I, what I can tell you about the, the project adventure training is that, um, that is a very specialized training. 
um, and that um, as you know, as, as the department onboards new staff members, um, as um, as as staff members retire, um, it's imperative for the phys ed department to continue to to to, to get people trained to do that. Um, in terms of what the, the, I, I do not believe, Mr. and maybe Mr. Mendez can correct me. I do not believe that this is a certification that would thereby qualify this person to train other people. Um, it would simply credential them to be able to actually facilitate and teach a class on this, a unit on this in phys ed. Is that, does that sound right, Mr. Mendez? Correct, and or uh, enable the district to facilitate project retention. Right. Um, so it's sort of, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an, it's an investment. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of akin almost to um, if a staff member were to take a course, um, you know, a, a college level course, as opposed to it, you know, that being reimbursed through the tuition reimbursement process. In this case, it's through the purchase order process as it's a, it's a professional development workshop. Got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So can I ask one? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other discussion? <laughs> one more question to piggyback on to Mr. Rothstein's. Um, so is this, is she, this teacher's going because we've had a, someone leave or retire from the district. So we needed to replace um, a teacher who can facilitate this program. Exactly. And, okay. and, and I think the other thing is, is you, you sort of um, for those, you know, for, for those staff members who are um, right. So like in any department, we have different areas of specialty. Um, so in, in the phys ed department, you wouldn't necessarily have all PE teachers that right. would be inclined to be able to do project adventure considering the specialized nature of it. So the idea is really to kind of build up your your, your, your stable, if you will, of people who are able to offer that program. Example, um, you know, you have, um, you have, you know, five sections of, of, of phys ed classes that offer project adventure. One staff member goes out on maternity leave or is on sick mm -hmm. leave. You know, that's not something where you can plug a sub in and it's not somewhere you can mm -hmm. plug even another teacher if they weren't certified. So it's always in the department's best interest to be training people on an ongoing basis so that quirks of schedule, additional sections, you know, you have people that are sort of on the bench, if you will. Um, not that I'm suggesting she would be, mm -hmm. but it's important to to keep that core mm -hmm. of people that are able to do it built up. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, and I forgot to mention that this this staff member is going to be specifically dedicated to the board. I, I should mention that the year. I hope you don't mind doing ropes courses. I, is that uh, bring it on? Oh, yeah, very good. <laughs> Dr. Cascone, <laughs> team am, building, team see? building. I am down for that. <laughs> Project Adventure was, I think, by far my favorite class. I oh, think, great. you know, I loved Project Adventure. That would be a great board. Anyway. I'm in as long as we can do it by Zoom. <laughs> I'm with you, Mr. Roths. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call one more time. Any further discussion on items uh, A and B? Okay, there being none, Ms. Flowers, would you do roll call vote, please? Roll call, Ms. Huerta? Yes. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Vice President Tunnycliffe? Yes. President Trixdales? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flowers. And uh, C, finance. Um, we have items uh, A1 and 2. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Vice President Tunnycliffe. Is there a second? I'll second. Yes. Uh, Ms. Huerta, was that you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on? Uh... Um, just so, to clarify, because I know this has come up pretty often, this is not funds that are directly, these are just funds that are passing through our budget. They're not 
budgeted and paid for by us. Is that a question or a statement? Possibly, oh, I guess both. I just want to make sure that because okay. that was the one of the questions that I had, and um, you know, in the beginning when I learned about these kinds of things, you know, why are we paying for Seton Hall speed bumps? You know, so yeah. just you know, for the community. Great. Any other discussion? I was just going to add to um, what Ms. Huerta said is that these, the ESSER funds are the federal funds um, that are related to COVID relief. So, um, and there's a, uh, each of these, we have ESSER one, um, ESSER two, um, which this is for, and then we're still waiting for information on ESSER three and how much that will be. Um, they each have, you know, specific timeframes of when these, when the funds can be used um, up, up until a certain point. And there are some parameters of what each of these groups of funds um, can be used for. Um, so for example, the ESSER two funds, this can be, you know, go, put towards learning loss, gaps, acceleration, things like that, <clears throat> air quality. Um, and the end of May is our application, which is why this is on the uh, agenda tonight. So that's all. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, any other questions, comments on finance? <laughs> uh, I just, just uh, okay. to clarify, I don't know, if, just to clarify, I don't know if, um, if Scott or Terry, if you were planning to respond to Melinda, but I don't know if anyone actually explained about item number one, how that works. I know that was, I don't know if that was the question or if it was a question or if that was just more for clarification to give the community. Oh, I thought that Ms. Huerta was clarifying it for the community's benefit. Gotcha. Ms. Flowers, did you want to add anything to that? I thought that was okay. Great. All right, Ms. Flowers, would you do the honors, please? Okay, roll call, Ms. Retta. Yes. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Vice President Tunnycliffe? Yes. President Trick Scales? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And item six, uh, miscellaneous, and Dr. Cascone um, mentioned this. This is a change in the district master calendar reflecting the unused snow emergency days, and the district will close on Friday, May 28th and June 22nd, which is attachment four. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Vice President Tony Cliff. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Rothstein. Uh, discussion on item six, number one. I would just like to um, say that I think it's a wonderful thing that this will give um, our families um, a long weekend, an extra long weekend, and I'm sure that they will appreciate it um, as well as our staff. So. Thank you for this suggestion. And um, I think we're gonna vote on it and make it happen. Mrs. Flowers. Ms. Retta? Yes. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Vice President Tunnycliffe? Yes. President Trick Scales? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flowers. And our um, board policy workshop officially begins. And our item eight is the second reading for the following board policy. Board policy number 9161, crowd control, attachment number five. Yeah. So I think, Terry, I think we're gonna do the that as part of the policy workshop. Okay, great, great. Okay, so I will turn it over to Ms. Merklinger and Mr. Rothstein. Well, um, mate, Scott, did you wanna tee it up first? Dr. Cascone? Did I lose him? 
I think he's having trouble with his mic because he was saying can, can a couple you hear of me? things. Oh, there you go. Yes, now I can. Hear you now. Okay, sorry. Um, I thought Miss Cohn had uh, muted me. Um, <laughs> So um, just a quick procedural question, uh, kind of a Robert's Rules question, Tanya. Um, is the, the board motions for the second reading, is that's, that's part of, um, when, when does that motion get, you know, when does that motion get considered? Like, does that get considered as part of the the business of the meeting as we were previously conducting and then we move into the work session yeah that's what i thought but yes right so yes, so just do. oh so, so president trick scales would preside over the 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 introduction of that motion um as the final as the final point of business for the for the business part of the meeting and then we would move into the deliberative policy work session Yes, that's correct. Oh, okay. okay. I apologize because the way it's numbered, it looks like we're doing the workshop first, and then yeah. once we're done with the right. workshop, yeah, then yeah. we're going to eight and then nine. That's right. yes. That's that's. Yeah. Uh, they that's should be reversed. Yeah, that's yeah. confusing. Yeah, we, Sorry gotcha. about okay. that. Okay. Right. My bad. No. Nope. Nope. No. Bad. I apologize. No problem. All right. So I would like to entertain a motion for the second reading and adoption of the following board policy: nine one six one crowd control attachment number five. Thank you, Dr. Cascom for that clarification. From my pleasure. Is there a motion? A motion. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a second? Seconded, yes. Thank you. Any discussion? Um, I had a question about uh, the first um, bullet point under the Super Essex Conference um, Spectator Code of Behavior. Um, are there other products that should be banned from um, from uh, or prohibited within the other than tobacco? Like I don't know if vaping mm. is allowed oh. and. Yeah, um, so Jennifer, I can answer this. These are the Super Essex Conference Spectator Code of Behavior rules. Mm -hmm. These come directly from them. This is okay. their set of rules. I actually checked that because I had the same question. Mm -hmm. um, but these are directly from their site. They have not changed them. And I believe okay. that's why they're in here this way. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate the clarification. Any other questions, uh, Dr. Kescon? No, I would just I would just uh, piggyback on that, uh, President Trick Scales, and, and I appreciate it. Um, of course, our you know our own um, student code of conduct, as well as relevant stat criminal statute, would you would also obviously apply to uh, the site as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Any other comments, concerns, questions? There being none, uh, Mrs. Flowers, roll call vote, please. My apologies. I didn't get the recording of who gave the second. Mr. Rothstein, I believe. Thank you very much. Okay, and roll call. Ms. Huerta? Yes. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Vice President Sunnycliffe? Yes. President Trigg Scales. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And now we are going to move into the board policy workshop and I will turn it over to Mr. Rothstein and Ms. Merklinger. Um, All right. So, did, you, did you want me to do the tee up? Sure. This will be a brief one. It'll be a brief one. Uh, so, um, Really, you know, I would say we have a, a, a it's a it's a relative we're sort of in a you know in a, in a, this meeting kind of is falling at a bit of a transition period in our policy work. Um, a good number of the remaining policies that are left to be moved forward for adoption by the board are are in kind of various feedback loops. Some are in human resources, some are in the business office, some are with the administration, some are in legal review, um, and you know our expectation is that we'll be able to move forward the vast majority of those um, at the two June meetings. Meetings, So we're sort of an in-between, but it's a good opportunity um, to really just um, take stock of where we are. Um, we do have uh, an item as well related to um, meeting conduct and 
uh, in governance. Um, you know, so, but with that, I would just turn it over to Mr. Rothstein and Ms. Merklinger as the policy chairs to facilitate the meeting. Thank you. So um, we've kind of been tracking um, the policies um, and how many, you know, are, have been adopted. And so the good news is that the majority have been um, done. We, we're, we're steadily moving through these and we're on the, like the last leg of the race. Um, so what Gary and I have done is gone through and kind of um, put together the ones that are under administrative review. Um, and there are 77 of those. Um, of those 77, um, we as the board have reviewed them through first reading already. What we've said is that these need either the um, spec eds to take a look, special services to take a look, nurses to take a look, uh, business buildings and grounds, um, HR, or some type of administrative review by the building principals, um, as well as um, the business office. So once um, we get those back, and I know Dr. Crescon has um, reached out to the, the point person on each of those, um, just to kind of give a status up or get a status update and just kind of get the ball moving with those folks. But our plan is that once those come in, we should be able to move the 77 um, as they come in right to second reading, um, barring that we have no concerns with any of the changes that any of our um, subject matter experts are, are suggesting. So. Um, if they came back to say, let's say on bed bugs, um, buildings and ground had some sort of feedback on that that we want to incorporate before we would do the second reading and adoption, we might make that change um, and have discussion about it. But at this point, um, of these 77, the board did not have any real changes or anything of concern. And again, we just wanted to get the input from the subject matter experts, um, especially with the HR policies. Uh, just making sure the Strauss estimates were in a line, um, Strauss estimate policies were aligned with our current HR policies, or if we need to make changes, that we're doing so. So um, that's where we are from an administration uh, standpoint. Um, I'll let Gary speak to the other the other outstanding uh, policies. And they are outstanding policies. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's about 50 remaining policies that are not with administration, but instead are sitting uh, in, in uh, sort of not exactly limbo, but they're awaiting action on the part of the board. And that responsibility falls uh, initially primarily to the, uh, to the policy committee, to Mrs. Merklinger and myself. And for, for many of these, um, they were reviewed in the past at earlier meetings, board members had recommendations for changes or questions. And what needs to happen at this point is that drafting, that um, uh, uh, consolidating of different policies, incorporating current West Orange language into Strauss SMA policies or seeking out other answers. Uh, there are some that have sort of loose ends that need to be tied up, um, questions that need to be uh, uh, pursued and followed up on to you know, reconfirm uh, uh, exactly what our next steps are with finalizing the wording on them. And then there is a group of policies, fortunately not many of them, I think about, about 15 of them or so, where there are no notes at all and uh, uh, in our listings, which either is because uh, there was no question for any changes on them. And so they are in fact ready to move forward for a second reading and adoption. Uh, or because they just needed to be revisited and the notes uh, caught up on uh, to determine what needs to happen. And so um, our request to the, the board members is um, if you see on the list of policies any that have no notes um, uh, assigned to them, and you know that that was a policy that you reviewed in the past as part of the work sessions that we've done uh, and that you had notes on them, we would certainly appreciate you um, you, you don't even have to, to fill them in. You could send an email over my way and uh, we'll keep the spreadsheet up to date, but we wanna make sure that we have all of that information entered before we finalize the language on the policies and move them forward. Um, so all in all, I think to sort of um, in, in big picture assess where we're at, um, the, uh, the administration has been great in responding to policies uh, that we had questions about and getting back, as Dr. Cascone said, many in that feedback loop that we expect to be coming back to us. 
hopefully largely uh, without change and ready to go into second reading and adoption. Uh, whatever isn't, we'll just make those adjustments and move them forward. And this group of uh, this set of policies uh, that are not yet adopted is narrowing uh, rapidly. So we're looking forward to working our way through the, through the remainder and uh, completing this adoption of the Strauss SMA policies. That's, that's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, so are we still on our timeline um, for the end of June? That's a great Is question. Is that what we're projecting? <laughs> that, that's still the goal. That's still the goal. I think there's, okay. <laughs> yeah, there, it, it's, you know, it's hard to, to answer because there's, uh, there are a number of policies. If, if we were just to the policies that were with the, um, with the board, um, I think I could say absolutely we can make sure that that comes through. Mm -hmm. uh, policies that are with the administration, I don't want to put Dr. Cascone on the spot, but I know that the, I know that the entire staff is incredibly busy uh, and we're, we're hopeful of getting all of those policies reviewed and back to us in a time frame that allows us to hit that June deadline. Uh, and I think Dr. Cascone knows that that's what our goal is. Great. And Mr. Rothstein, I know that um, you did some inquiry with Strauss Esme. Um, you know, I worked with them initially uh, along with Ms. Mordecai. Um, would you tell us, um, the rest of the board, what the process is once all of these do come back? What are the next steps and what's the timeline from there? Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's actually, it's a bit of an extended timeline beyond what I thought uh, mm -hmm. was going to be the situation. So, at, at the moment, the, the goals that we're tracking to, toward are to have all of the policies approved and adopted um, before the end of June. Let's assume that we hit that deadline because we're all staying positive uh, on this and working hard to hit that deadline. From the moment that we have all of those policies adopted, they are, as far as I understand, the official policies of the West Orange School District, the West Orange Board of Education. Those policies and bylaws are the policies and bylaws that govern us. The last step of this, the last leg of the process to fully complete it is to have all of those policies available on the website and not just available on the website the way that, that our current policies are available on the website, but in a much more searchable uh, format than what we've been used to. Strauss SMA uh, makes it easier to search for and find policies and find information within policies. So that's really what the, uh, um, the information that I found out in my communications from them is that there's about a two month period uh, between the moment that we confirm that we've adopted all of the policies and that they are able to complete their work of taking the language all, all of all of our policies, getting it uploaded into their system and creating that, that West Orange specific uh, website or microsite for lack of a better term uh, where members of the public can search our policies, uh, um, uh, everything that we've adopted. So if we hit that end of June adoption date, uh, then it wouldn't be, I would expect, until the end of the summer, the start of the school year before those policies were available on the website and searchable. I believe that everything that's been adopted is available on the website in the form of attachments at, um, uh, to our meetings over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, and maybe there's a way to sort of organize those or group them together, um, but it, they're just unfortunately not searchable uh, in that format. Yeah, um, they are in PDF on our website right now. Um, but just to take a step back in regards to the timeline. So um, our next board meeting is June 7th. Um, our next policy workshop is June 10th. So to, to the point that we were speaking about before, where if we were to get back any policies before um, the agenda is set for that June 7th meeting, we could move those forward because they don't require any further review. Just It was just having the administration of some aspect take a look at them. Those could be more moved forward for second reading at that meeting. Um, the 10th, and, and Gary, definitely correct me if I'm wrong here, but our plan is that we're going to get this spreadsheet um, out to the, the board to review, um, fill in any notes you have, organize it, and then, of course, for the next workshop, if there were any policies that we wanted to discuss, um, we'll set that up, um, break it up depending on the number that we need to discuss, 
Um, and then the idea would be by the next uh, policy meeting, which I believe is the 14th, um, any additional uh, work. So the goal is definitely to have everything pushed for second reading and be ready to go by the 21st meeting. So based on what the numbers are looking like, it looks like I think that is definitely uh, doable. So I agree, you know, Gary, I think that's definitely doable for us. Um, I'm optimistic, Ms. Merklinger, uh, in terms of the administrative review policies. Um, my, my thought would be, um, right, we have that June 10th meeting, so that, that could be a, you know, a good opportunity if we have policies that have come back with edits you know, for the board to consider those edits and have those edits explained. And then those could be moved forward on the 21st for final. So that, that, that works well for us. Um, could you um, state again, Gary, I'm sorry, because I missed it. So there are 77 under administrative review. There are yes. 50 remaining to be le uh, like looked over by us or that have no notations. Uh, well, of, of the 50 There's, remaining that are sitting with the, with the um, policy committee and with the Board of Education, most of those have notations and it's clear what the next steps are. And Mrs. Merklinger, Mrs. Merklinger, blah, Mrs. Merklinger and I. Cheryl's are, cool. You can go, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> we're working our way. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> we're working our way through those notes and, uh, and making uh, the notations and adjustments and next steps on those policies so they're ready to go. There's, there's a smaller number of those remaining policies, about 15 of them that were right. lacking notes. And then right. what we needed to do is confirm with those. I just wanna double check and make sure that it's not that the notes are missing, but that it's in fact that there were no comments on them. And then as long as we can confirm that, we're ready to move those forward for second reading and adoption. So, so Gary, to that point, with those 15, if we could just add, we'll get the link out to the Google Doc. Um, but if we could just ask the team if maybe by um, next Friday, the 28th, if you could make sure your notes are in on those 15 policies. Um, and then that way we can be ready if we are able to move any for second reading on the 7th, um, we would have some time to get that over to Dr. Cascone and, and um, Terry and Jennifer for the agenda. And then to be clear, I just counted and I was off. My 15 are actually 24. I was close. close. I was very close. Close, close. Um, but yeah, if we could just ask everyone just to go in and look at those um, that are blank, we'll highlight them so you see them. If you have notes, um, certainly add them in. If you didn't, just leave it blank, um, and we'll know that those are ones that are ready to go. Like Gary and I, um, Gary said, we just want to make sure that we didn't miss any notes. Um, just in between all of us taking notes, um, Miss Hughes and and Scott um, taking notes, and and everyone kind of trying to transcribe them into the document. Um, we just want to make sure nothing lost, got lost in transition, so. Can I just ask a quick question? Is this on um, Google Drive, the whole list? Is that where we can find everything? And would you mind uh, circulating the link again, just to make sure we have the correct Yeah, one? we're going to. Absolutely. Okay, going to. great, thank you so much. Yeah, we're just gonna clean it up a little bit and then okay. um, do that. Awesome. So I think that really um, clears up the status of where we're at and what the next steps are and, and how we're moving forward. And then I know that there's, um, there are two, two other items, um, President Trig Scales, that uh, um, you had brought to us for um, consideration for adoption into bylaws, I believe, if I'm understanding correctly. And, um, and I think that you were going to give us uh, an overview of, uh, of what those are and your thoughts on those. Right. Yeah, so if I could just jump in real quick. So what um, I know, so for the folks that are on the phone, there are two um, additional, there are two codes um, that Terry had brought to our attention that um, what I'd like to do, and um, Terry, if you don't mind, is just kind of giving us what your vision and thoughts are for these. Um, so we can just get a better understanding of how we want to incorporate these into the Strauss SMA um, policies. I was just about to. Thank you very much. All right. So quite a while ago, um, I handed out to the board uh, two documents, three documents, actually. 
um, that I received from Charlene Peterson, who is our field service rep with New Jersey School Boards Association. One is called the Code of Conduct for Remote Meetings. And what most um, boards of ed have done, and we are a little late to the party, um, is to put this right in with the Code of Conduct and the bylaws. Um, and as I had shared with, um, with the board before, this one is just misnumbered. So there's no number one missing actually on this sheet, it's just misnumbered. So if we agree to do this, and it is strongly recommended that we do, um, as I said, this is really dealing with the COVID-19 and the Governor Murphy's executive order um, relative to all virtual meetings. We wanna be very optimistic and hope that we would never have to use this. And if we do, it probably would be revised because again, this is Governor Murphy's executive order number 107. So if we had to go back and change it, if it was a different executive order, we could do it. But we would certainly have this in place for future reference as far as how board members are to conduct themselves um, in remote meetings. Um, so that's the background on this one. Any questions? I mean, it has to be rewritten. It's, it's, it's going to pop right in into bylaws. Um, we have to put our names in there, all of that. This is just a, a draft. So think, any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that the, the, the policy that it would get attached to, if I'm understanding correctly, would be Strauss Esme policy 0164. I don't know if you had noted that anywhere and can confirm that, but that's, mm. that's called conduct of board meetings. Yeah, I thought I put it somewhere, but maybe that's not the right one. It's in bylaws. Yeah. What was the number, Gary? I'm sorry. Uh, 0164. Which basically uh, uh, just speaks to the, the, uh, the rules for how the meeting is conducted. Uh, you know, presumably a live uh, uh, in-person meeting. And so yeah, this is one that I think, uh, yeah, uh, President Trigscales, you had sent this around before. And when mm -hmm. we looked at this, this is where it seemed to make sense as um, sort of a part two, a if the meeting is being conducted remote instead of in person, mm -hmm. these are the guidelines that govern uh, the conduct for those meetings. And that was one thing that I think that uh, um, Cheryl and I had discussed was a question about, does it make sense to to um, add this to that existing policy? Does it become its own number like an 0164.1 kind of scenario? And if it did, how do we communicate that with Strauss Esme? Those were really the only questions that I had about what exactly is the right way to get this incorporated. Right, I think it would be a 0.1 or A or however Strauss Esme uh, details additional um, bylaws or policies and they'll just put it in, they, they will find a place to put it in for us. And do we need to, from your work with them in the past, do we need to reach out to them to get them to advise what number we should use? I think so. Just... I think so. Mm -hmm. I had a question in regards to, has this been approved already? Is this one of the policies that, no, this is the one, one of those that requires some additional wording or finalization? Oh. Oh, do you mean the the bylaw zero one six four, or do you or do you mean the the remote meeting? The one oh one six four. Oh, let me double check that. Uh, if you'll give me one moment, I can tell you. Actually, this is an interesting thing. It has been. It looks like we adopted. Well, we actually we adopted did. a 0164.6, which is called remote public board meetings during a declared emergency. I think that was a requirement. I believe if yes. I remember correctly, yeah. we had to, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So this would be just in case and moving forward. But the 0164. And 0164, the conduct of so board meetings has not yet been um, been adopted. And there we do have pretty comprehensive notes in there of what we were looking to edit. So would yes, this, 
I'm sorry, would this then the code of conduct replace the one that we approved at the beginning of the COVID crisis pandemic? <laughs> or is the this an addition one, to? I think it's an addition to, I think the one for six, and I could be wrong, um, but because I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe that mm -hmm. was specifically from the government or from the state in regards to COVID. Like it was specific to COVID. Mm -hmm. What number um, is that again? I'm sorry, Gary. It's uh, it's zero one six four point six. Yeah, and that I'm with Cheryl. That was the mandated actually, one, right? Correct. Yeah, and it's it's uh, I'm gonna have to find that um, particular policy. It's not in the grouping of policies that I have open right now, so I'll have to search for that. But the L one six four, Gary, you're right. We we did not adopt that yet. So this would be something we would add in. And, and you're right. We do have extensive notes with next steps. So um. yeah, I just didn't want this one to get lost in the sauce. Um, so if we already have something that this is a part of, or how, how however the committee wants to handle it, I just want to ensure that it gets in there. Well, how great would it be if we accidentally already adopted this? That would be <laughs> fabulous. We're super um, efficient, you are. <laughs> but if not, and if there are any discrepancies, what we'll do is Cheryl and I will note what those discrepancies are, right. and that can become a part of the discussion for the next step. And I can also uh, um, reach out to Strauss Esme to, if it looks like we want to adopt something separate, to ask them about the numbering. Fabulous, fabulous. All right. And moving right along, the second one is a... a Code of Code Governance, of go best, is that me? No, I think, oh, uh, Code of Governance, Best Practices. And again, um, Charlene shared with me that um, most boards um, do use something very similar to this. Um, again, it's a sample, and so we can go through it and tailor it to meet our needs. But this is much more specific as to how we conduct meetings. Um, I'd like to make sure we include something about committee work because there isn't anything specific as to how we conduct committee work. And so I have another one that I sent to you a few minutes ago, but you also got this quite a while ago, Milburn, um, looking at their guidelines. And Charlene did share with us that of all of the districts that she works with, uh, when I asked her for an example, she thought that this was a fine example of how a board has come together and um, agreed on how they do business. So, so just I, looking at, sorry, Cheryl, are you, yes? No, no, I was about to ask, I thought you were done, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm gonna explain what this is. Um, so on, on this sample, there are three parts, before a meeting, during a meeting, and after a meeting. And if you look through, I'm not going to read them to you. But if we can agree on these three areas um, that deal specifically with board meetings, then if you refer to the Milburn, um, they do something similar with the committee meetings. And so I'd like us to have a short discussion also on the sample board of education, they have a paragraph midway down. Um, and I will read that if any board member feels that another board member has violated any provision of this agreement, that board member shall personally talk with the offending board member in an attempt to resolve the issue. If the attempt fails, the board member who feels that another board member has violated this agreement shall bring the matter to the attention of the entire board. Any grievances that arise should be dealt with at the earliest practical opportunity. And then, of course, at the bottom, it would be um, if we want to sign off on it. So I'm going to back up. I'm, I'm asking you to look at three things um, as far as the meeting, before a meeting, during a meeting, after a meeting. And then I'm asking you to refer to committee work, um, which is part of the best practice from from Milburn. So, so I, I've now teed that up. Yeah, so what, um, you know, so Gary and I had kind of talked about this and what we thought was with this one, similar to how what I did with the um, advertising, if you want to put together something um, based on the Milburn, based on where you're seeing this go, 
um, just like what you teed up. And then we can take a look at it. So we have something to review and kind of put it, sink our teeth into as a board versus taking pieces and, and kind of sitting here and, and spending time going over it. Um, if just I want to do it or will the, the committee do it, the uh, policy committee, that's who I'm bringing it to is the policy committee. Are you suggesting you and Gary that I as the president do it? Is that, am I clear in what you're saying? Well, because, because it seems you know, just to we're in, make sure, just to ensure that we're capturing what your vision is for it, because I can certainly put this something together, but I don't know that it would capture your vision of what you're looking to get um, out of this. So that's why I was, you know, we were thinking or suggesting um, you're, okay. you're taking it, taking it together. But if I'm certainly happy to do it, I just want, like I said, I didn't want to, I don't want to do double work. So if I didn't want to put something together and then it not be where what you were looking to. Well, it's not my vision. It's the vision of the board. I could have done this and given it to you in the first place, but that was not my choice. That's why I'm bringing it to the board now so that we can have a discussion. Um, okay. So what, what, what we'll do is we can, we'll take the Melbourne, we'll take what you just mentioned and this um, code of governance, the sample, um, put something together so everyone can kind of take a look at it. And then for our next workshop, um, go through it and work through it. Um, I had something to add, Miss right. uh, President Terry Trick Scales. I think I, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think I did uh, review this in the beginning and kind of edit it to have. I'm gonna have to dig in through the emails, but I believe I did some type of adjustments Good. for the committee. Um, and I think even um, Vice President Tony Cliff, I sent it to you as well to take a look at it. And I think. Um, I can try. I'll, I'll dig it up and forward it to you, Cheryl. Please, okay. please do. Yeah, so if, if you've done that, um, let's send it all to the policy committee so that they can get the input um, from each of us. Yeah. So I would yeah, suggest you, that we do that. So I also yeah. wanted to ask, so with, with the policy that we were talking about a moment ago, the code of conduct for remote mm -hmm. meetings, there was, there's an existing policy that it seems that that's related to. Uh, for the code of governance, best practices um, for meetings and for uh, committee meetings, I'm I'm at at my search. I'm not finding a policy that's immediately obvious that it would attach to either uh, as part of that policy or as like a a, a point one or point two. Um, is there something that anyone else on the board was aware of that would make sense to associate that with? Um, I was looking at, um, in the bylaws, role of the board. Um, that's a possible spot, but perhaps Strauss Esme, when you speak to them, uh, Mr. Rothstein, they could suggest a spot for it. Okay. Do you have, um, do you have that number? I actually gave you West Orange numbers that I put right. in my, yeah, I realized Correct. I yeah, didn't do Strauss, Strauss Esme. Esme that I was looking yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. I'm not finding that obvious match. It, it probably, there probably is a match. Um, mm -hmm. It was just nothing that was jumping out, um, obviously, so. Okay. Um, okay, well, well, we'll look for it. And like you said, if if nothing's there, we'll consult with Strauss Esme about okay, where great. it would make sense to include this. Because I'm pretty sure they've done it for other districts. So it should live comfortably somewhere in Strauss Esme. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think um, I, I notated here. I don't know if this will help you any, Gary. It says um, West Orange 9130 and Strauss Esme 0155. But it looks like it was already approved in the second reading at the February 3rd policy workshop. Yeah, so 0155 deals specifically with um, committees. And I think that we want to go more broad than that. But thank you for calling that out, because then what I can do is look at that again, at the language of that um, policy. Yeah, that it's a very committee specific policy. Um, I feel like what, what we're look what we're really looking at here, especially in the example of, uh, from Milburn, is a combination of um, guidelines and best practices for both meetings and committees. Um, you know, I actually wonder, we've got some thinking to do around this. I wonder if the meetings portion of it, the before, during, and after, 
uh, belongs belongs as a part of 0164 and the code of conduct for remote meetings as well. And then committees can duplicate some of that if needed mm. um, and then speak specifically to, uh, uh, to the best practices for committee work. Right. It, it's gonna be a little bit of, of thinking and editing to figure out the best way to approach this. And you know, again, like, like you said, I, I'll bet Strauss Esme has done this for other school districts and they can probably advise us too. Right. Okay, but this I is good. Like, it. I have a much more clear idea now of what we're doing with this. So thank you for explaining that. My pleasure. Um, so with that, I think if there are no other questions during policies or um, any of the items that were on the list or what our next steps are timeline. Um, if there are no further questions, then I think um, Dr. C, we can wrap up. I guess just one question or oh, well, a couple of questions. Sorry, Cheryl. So you said no, no, that no. we wanted to review this um, or you wanted to get our notes if we had any by what date was that? Um, by, by the 28th. By the 28th. Yep. And so when will you be sending that out for us to review? Or is there a specific, I don't know. Um, I think Gary and I are gonna clean it up with, by the end of this weekend and get that over. Okay. Thanks, that's all. Okay, so are we, have we concluded with, um, our board policy workshop. I think we're good. Thank you. We're good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Merklinger and Mr. Rothstein. As usual, you have done a, a great job in um, getting us close to the finish line. So thank you very, very much. And now we're going to move into petitions and hearings of citizens. And these are questions um, of your choice on agenda, off agenda items. So Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Yes, so just a reminder, you can use the raise hand feature. Um, when I call your name, please state your full name and address for the record, and then make your comment. The timer will switch to three minutes when I hit play. Uh, Simona Chindea, if you can unmute yourself and state your full name and address. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Simona Chindea. Um, I live in West Orange. Um, I'm a mother of three students, um, high school graduate, um, middle schooler, and, and uh, uh, elementary school um, student. And uh, the reason for which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here today, actually in 15 years, is my first time addressing a, a school board. Um, I would like to thank you for giving me the word. I would also like to thank you for your hard work. I'm seeing that the uh, questions are being answered. Our concerns are being looked into. Um, we um, are a group of parents that are looking into what happens with uh, our children being students again in schools and particularly looking at the issue of uh, masks being removed. Um, it, breaks my heart to see them um, going out and being lined up um, for five minutes because otherwise they would be stuck for three hours in a row behind um, plexiglass shields with a mask on, constantly nagged to put their um, uh, masks up. Uh, now we have the choice of being vaccinated if we believe in that or not. Um, and uh, that should give us the freedom to choose whether we uh, uh, when uh, wear the mask or not, um, because it turns out uh, it causes more harm than, uh, than, than benefit. And those that benefit from that uh, cannot trade it off for um, um, having the children uh, going through all pain and uh, no gain. So um, I'm, I'm seeing that um, you have um, um, the, the power to take uh, um, decisions when it comes to uh, the budget, the um, resources, um, the academics, um, the days off, 
um, but this is really an, an issue with our children as they are looking forward to, to go to school and, and see their friends. And actually, in your support, I'm seeing that the superintendent of Ocean County uh, sent a letter today to Governor Murphy asking him to end uh, the mask requirements. I would really appreciate your support to this, especially when uh, we have high schoolers that only graduate from high school once in their lifetime, and we want to keep the memory uh, with with their smiles on uh, instead of the the face masks um, when it comes to uh, uh, enjoying that moment. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Rachel Keen. You may unmute yourself, state your name and address, Hi. and make your comment. Hi, Rachel Keen. Uh, 22 Schmidt Road. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, um, the plexiglass in the school and um, if and when it's going to be removed. Um, the CDC removed uh, plexiglass or barriers of any kind from their guidance um, March 19th. And I think um, just a few days later, the New Jersey Department of Health updated their guidance to say that it's optional um, and not necessary. And um, I guess a week or two after that, we purchased, uh, I think 6,000 desks worth of plexiglass or, or shields or whatever it's made out of. Um, there's, I, I don't know what it's made out of, but there's um, <clears throat> information that it can obstruct airflow um, and plexiglass itself is actually a fire hazard. So. Um, it's not allowed in New York State. So I don't know what ours is made out of, but I just think it kind of takes away from the uh, joy of going to school and trying to decide if I'm basically going to put my son in kindergarten next year. So I, I, um, I'm making a choice between his education, which I think he'll get a better education in, in Redwood Elementary School, or his um, emotional well-being, which I think he'll get a better uh, chance of in a private, um, in, in his daycare basically, which is probably not as good an education, but you know, he'll be able to play. He'll, he'll get to go outside and go on the playground and take his mask off to be on the playground. Um, he, he is allowed to touch other children and play with them and interact and giggle. And um, he, he hugs his teacher, he loves his teacher. Um, he takes his mask off for lunch. He has two snacks a day. Um, he, he sometimes doesn't wear his mask correctly at all and nobody yells at him and it's fine. Um, so I, I want to know what, um, we're doing to, uh, to keep our children's emotional, um, well-being intact. And part of that is getting rid of the plexiglass, which has no benefit, um, letting them play outside, having mask breaks, letting them eat, letting them have snacks. Um, I think that their humanity has been completely robbed this year, particularly by our school district and the decisions that have been made. And I, I really hope that everybody who's listening tonight knows that and thinks about and thinks about that because um, there, there was no reason for it. There was no scientific reason for it. Um, so anyway, I, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do with my son next year. And, and I'd like to know the answer to these questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Julie Bookbinder, if you can unmute yourself, state your full name and address and then make your comment, please. Hi, Julie Bookbinder, 37 Collimore. I'm calling to find out, um, uh, hopefully an answer to your question I asked maybe two meetings ago and followed up with an email but didn't get a response, which is in view of the extensive presentation by Ms. Demendez and comments by Dr. Cascon that the children are really having gains by being back in person. Is there at this point any discussion of additional on-site time this school year, whether it be Fridays, whether it be full days, whether it be for elementary or for the entire district? Is that discussion still happening or is it done? The offices of parents and gardens are reopening. Companies are starting to ask people to go back to work. And, you know, the adults are in limbo, not knowing. We're seeing other school districts go back to full day, some for elementary, some for district wide. Livingston, as you know, Caldwell, West Caldwell um, is planning for June. Uh, not in Essex County, but in Morris County and Precipitating Troy Hills, which is a, a larger district, has been back in May. So 
I'm curious if the discussion is ongoing or if West Orange has decided that this is it for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, just one last call to see if there's anybody that would like to make a comment from the audience. Sandra Mordecai, you may unmute yourself, state your name and address. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Sandra Mordecai, 516 Pleasant Valley Way. Um, sorry, I had to work late, so I didn't get on early enough. But I wanted to say thank you for restoring the busing. Um, you know, it's living in West Orange all these years, we know these hills very well. And um, it's very dangerous. So I'm truly appreciated that you did that. Um, I have a question about the summer program. I know you already voted on it, but I couldn't tell if there was a summer program for special ed students and for WOAP. And on the last meeting, during the presentation that uh, Assistant Superintendent De Mendez gave, she mentioned that the WOAP numbers went from nine to 33. I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the school was mostly virtual for over a year now, how did the number of students in WOA go from nine to 33? Of course, it's probably a confidential answer, but I, I was just wondering about that. Um, in personnel one, it, the sidebar appears to mostly be related to one teacher because the teacher's mentioned in the sidebar. Why wouldn't that teacher also sign even though the union has signed? because the name is there. And um, Finance A1, the Seton Hall pass-through, although it is a pass-through, it's curious to note that um, the school district doesn't install speed bumps. So if the town of West Orange is installing speed bumps over at Seton Hall, is this something that the Board of Ed Town Council liaisons discuss together as it relates to the pass-through in Seton Hall and actually putting speed bumps down because I know the Buildings and Grounds Department for the school district doesn't put speed bumps down on the road. That's a town's job. And that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie Turner, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your full name and address, uh, and then make your comment. Hi, Leslie Turner, Five Club Boulevard. I'm um, just wondering if it was a district-wide decision or school-specific to handle kindergarten orientation um, <clears throat> differently this year than obviously previous pre-COVID years. Um, so we're currently doing a virtual parent only and then in-person for the kids alone. And I know a lot of parents have concerns about sending their kindergartner in for two hour, two and a half hours by themselves as the first introduction to school. Um, if someone could respond to that and let me know if it's a school only decision. Ms. Turner, is that all you have? They answer all the questions at the end. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alexandra Mizrahi, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your full name and address. Thank you, Cookie. Alexandra Mishrahi, 30, uh, 35 Washington Avenue, West Orange. Um, well, I'm happy that to hear, I'm, I'm, I'm running late coming in, but I'm happy to hear there was um, the situation for the boss was addressed. Thank you for that, for do the right thing and do your job. My question is in regards of the bill that just passed for special education, uh, S3434 in regards of extension, for the student with 18 and 21 program. I wanted to know what is or take, what we're gonna, how we're gonna stand it, how we're gonna notify the families and how we're gonna put it on place as is a law. That's pretty much all for me for today. So um, two minutes and 19, I did very good. So have a good <laughs> night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, at this point, I am not seeing any other hands at all. So back to you. Uh, oh, Michaela Bennett, you should be able to unmute yourself um, and state your full name and address, please. Can you hear me? Ooh, you're very broken. Are you up. able to hear me? Oh, now we can, yes. You can hear me now? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, Michaela Bennett, Old Indian Road. I'm sorry. I was having, I, I had raised my hand and then for whatever reason it lowered, I got kicked off. So hopefully you'll be able to hear me okay. Um, I don't really have many comments. I wanted to thank you for restoring um, the budget for uh, transportation. Uh, I think it's super important that you uh, heard the community and responded in kind. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to just uh, take the opportunity to thank Dr. Cascone and the Board of Education for all of the hard work um, that you've put forward in giving our students as meaningful of an education as you possibly could. Um, it is extremely difficult to be responding in a time of crisis and to be responding to seemingly discordant um, interests of multiple people while staying in line with the law. And I just wanna acknowledge um, the fact that as difficult as it all was and as unsatisfied as many are, I think you're doing an excellent job. Are you doing a perfect job? No, nobody is perfect. I think you're doing an excellent job at um, understanding and addressing the needs of our students, of coming up with creative ways in which to pivot to remote education and to respond to the concerns of parents who need more than what remote education provides. I would just like to mention one other point, which I think is extremely important. Um, Admittedly, I'm not as up to speed, so I don't know if you've made changes, but honors programming should be accessible to all students and should never be dependent upon a test. Um, you've, most of you have heard me say this before, but I will say it again. Our son was determined to not be eligible for honors programming when he was leaving fifth grade, despite the fact that his teachers and his grades spoke different, a different message. Thankfully, he was in, enrolled in honors programming in all subjects available in the sixth grade, made honor roll every quarter, the same for seventh grade. And here in eighth grade, he is making high honors in every quarter and looking forward to the IMS programming at the high school. So I just want to, I guess, plug the idea that everyone should be entitled to give it a try in sixth grade, anybody who wants to, and then determine whether or not the rigor is, you know, something that they want to continue as they move on with their education. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I do believe um, we now have no hands currently raised. So I turn it back over to you, uh, Ms. Trickscales. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Um, and thank you to uh, our participants this evening and to the folks who have posed questions. And um, as we often do, I'm going to defer to Dr. Kescon, uh for the first round of answers. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, President Trick Scales, and thank you to our attendees and for the questions. Um, I shall uh, do my best to, um, to answer as many of them as possible. Um, in terms of uh, Ms. Jindaya's um, uh, questions about the masks, um, as I've sort of um, you know responded in, in various emails to folks over the course of the year, um, you know, the Board of Education, the, the superintendent of schools, we don't, we don't promulgate, we don't, we don't create public health policy. Um, be a lot easier if we did on some level, but we don't. Um, you know, those, those guidelines are, um, are, are passed down to us. Um, how I may feel about them personally um, is of absolutely no consequence um, to ultimately how um, I have to um, lead and manage the operations of the district. And um, presently, um, 
you know, the, um, the, the mandate remains, um, but I am optimistic that um, as we've heard the federal, uh, the CDC guidelines, the federal guidelines now move towards if you're vaccinated, um, you, you, you're not required to wear a mask. I do, and, and although that has not gone into effect in New Jersey yet, as far as last time I spoke with the Department of Health, I am optimistic that that will be the case <clears throat> and that, you know, there, there will be a differentiated um, expectation or guideline next year in schools for those who are vaccinated versus those who aren't. But that's just me as a layman, medical layperson, just sort of making a prediction. Um, until such time, um, you know, we are required to follow those guidelines, um, but on a personal level, on a on an emo, you know sort of an emotional level, I I agree with many of the things you're saying. Um, relative to Mrs. Keene's uh, questions, um, you know what I will say is is that um, I can revisit that conversation uh, with the local Department of Health. I will say that we are not certainly not the only school district um, that continues to uh, utilize uh, the barriers. Um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, and, and, and respectfully, just as, um, as someone who actually has been in the schools uh, this year and, uh, and seen the students um, and seen the teachers, um, I've been, there, I've seen nothing but humanity. I mean, other than the masks, which aren't great, but, um, you know, but I've seen nothing but humanity. I've, between students, between teachers and students, um, I've seen, I've, I've had the, the absolute pleasure privilege of actually it's been the best part of my year by far has been actually interacting with the kids in the classrooms and seeing their positivity and their smiles um you know i i think that this pandemic um has robbed all of us to some extent of of aspects of our humanity um it it wasn't this board of education that robbed people of humanity or or but the superintendent that robbed the district of humanity. It, it was the pandemic and it was the conditions under which we were required to operate by virtue of the guidelines. Um, but that being said, whether it's the interactions that have been um, occurring that I've seen with teachers online or certainly those in school, I've seen a, a tremendous amount of warmth um, and, and positivity. And of course, as we look forward to next year um, and being in, um, we we look forward to an environment that that resembles a, a greater degree of normalcy and where there's um, there's more opportunities for students to uh, to get back to normal. Um, it, relative to Miss Bookbinder's uh, question, um, being being you know transparent and truthful, we are we have no plans at this point in time to make any additional pivots on the K five level um, or on the six twelve level, um, and and part of that is. Um, and, and I hate to even use this word because it's, it's sort of been, you know, kind of, kind of projected back to me and it's sort of become a, you know, sort of a, a like a, like a, like a lightning rod is this idea of scheduling. Well, you know, why are we, be, why are we, um, why is scheduling a stumbling block? And, and, and I, I think what it is, is, is that, um, to make another change in schedule at this point in time. Um, and all of the additional adjustments and transitions that come with changing schedules again to put students and to put teachers and to put parents through yet another schedule change. Um, it's just not, and, and the other piece is, is that right now we've sort of run out of runway in terms of what that change would look like. We've, listen, we've had conversations about Friday and, and um, you know, I understand that there's still a, a sort of a lack of full understanding of why that's problematic. Um, though I can say that it really comes down to space and it comes down to staff. Um, it comes down to the fact that when we got our buildings ready to open, um, you know, we've been clear and transparent in the fact that that's not all of our spaces. There are spaces in every single one of our buildings, um, and that that are not we're not able to use because they are not adequately ventilated. Now we are working on remediating on those um, this year and over the course of the summer. But when you talk about pulling kids out physically out of a room as to pulling kids out virtually from a room, 
it's two completely different things and it requires space and space in many cases that we don't have. I was at Kelly Elementary School the other day. Kelly Elementary School has over 300 students in the building on a daily basis, a large number of students. Um, and there is simply um, not the space to pull kids out. The staffing piece comes from when you have teachers that are itinerant and are able to teach cohorts of students from multiple schools, and now you put them place bound in a school, um, they are no longer able to do that. And so what that does is, is it takes our class size, our virtual class size, and increases it from 20 to 40. So, you know, I, I think we, you know, we can, I'm not sure that um, we're ever necessarily going to see eye to eye on that. I think we've, you know, I, I've, I've indicated that ultimately as the chief school administrator, the person responsible for operations and the educational uh, processes of the district, it, it's been a call that I've made um, and we're focused on next year, but at the same time, um, you know, we, we have our kids in more now than they were several weeks ago, but Ms. Bookbinder being transparent, we, we are not planning for any additional pivots at this point in time. Uh, Ms. Mordecai, um, some good questions. Um, I, I can't, you know, I'm not prepared to answer the question. I, I think you were referring to the West Orange Mountaineer Academy, if I'm not mistaken. I can't answer that question uh, in terms of, you know, understanding the increase in enrollment, though I might hypothesize that it has to do with the fact that kids who were, who were perhaps borderline for that program, um, perhaps um, were identified as in really needing something additional um, by virtue of having been in virtual and um, have been brought in in order to make sure that uh, they're able to graduate. But I admittedly, I don't have the answer to that, but I will find out. Um, the reason the, the, the sidebar is signed by the union is that the sidebar is a, and I, is a, it, is it basically an appendix to the actual collective bargaining agreement um, between the Board of Education and the association. Um, so just as the association president and the board um, would sign uh, a sidebar agreement in the same way that's done, um, I'm sorry, would sign the actual CBA is the same way that it's done um, with the sidebar because the sidebar is not an agreement between uh, the district and that teacher. It's really an agreement between um, the, the board and uh, the teachers association or the collective bargaining unit. Uh, my understanding whether the Seton Hall project is that Seton Hall Prep is paying for it, is doing it, um, and that there has been some collaboration uh, on that project and, and inclusive conversation with the township uh, on that. But my understanding is that Seton Hall Prep is, is paying for it and is actually, um, is actually contracting to have that work done. Um, I appreciated that question about kindergarten orientation. Um, I, I will have to do some additional um, fact finding on that. Um, what, I, what I can say definitively is that whereas in previous years, uh, the, the kindergarten orientation happened on the same day in all schools. Um, in this year, I gave the principals a little bit more freedom to, you know, to implement their kindergarten orientations at a time that worked within their schedule and for their staff. So they are happening on different days, different from previous years. Um, you know, my my understanding of the way they've happened in the past has been that, yes, parents accompany the students, but typically then the parents kind of go to one location and have an orientation and then the students go to the classrooms. Um, I'm surprised to hear that there isn't at least an opportunity for a parental meet and greet. Um, what I would ask for that parent is, and, and the answer to the question is that might very well be a discretionary decision on the part of the building principal. I am very interested in understanding that. Um, so if that parent would uh, kindly email me so that I understand, um, you know, which school that is, and I can do a little bit of fact finding on that because, um, you know, I, we, we, we want our kindergarten parents to have an opportunity to, to, to be there in some capacity, um, if possible. Um, I want to thank Ms. Misrahi for the question about Bill 3434. Um, it's, it's, it's very timely that you asked that question. I was on a, a call today with a number of superintendents and we were speaking about that. <clears throat> and I was in a million directions today, but I did have the wherewithal to circle back with, um, with Ms. Flowers in the business office and, um, and speak with Ms. Ms. Gogarty Fitzgerald so we can kind of huddle up on that. Um, really unpack the law, understand which students in our district it might apply to, and start reaching out to those parents to apprise them of what um, their rights 
uh, are under the law and so that we can obviously be in com in compliance and uh, in, in alignment with that law. Uh, but there's some work to do there, uh, Alex, to be honest with you, but it'll be done uh, in the immediate term um, this week and early next week. Um, and and uh, you know, Miss Bennett, um, appreciate the um, the you know the, the positive words and you know honors is um, you know I, I, philosophically I agree with you. You know, um, I, I think that it's very much a similar conversation when we talk about gifted and talented, right? Um, you know, orthodox approaches to gifted and talented and honors are a bit anachronistic when we kind of compare them with sort of what we've learned about intelligence and multiple intelligences, what we've learned about equity and access, right? Um, and as the overall level of rigor in the mainstream general education classroom has gone up from what it used to be. I think it's really necessitated a reevaluation and everything we know for deck for generations about the arguments against tracking, right? Um, so honors, gifted and talented, it is, it is rife for really, I would argue, an inclusive conversation amongst varied stakeholders. And I, you know, we're, and by the way, I don't know, Ms. Trig Scales or others, whether you were going to herald the, um, the, 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 uh, the district goal setting town hall and the forthcoming survey. Um, maybe that's uh, one item we could note and add to the survey is honors um, and honors access and, you know, uh, entrance. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of strong opinions on this topic. And so I think we need to bring diverse perspectives together on this, both from within the community and within the school district and understand perspectives and viewpoints on it and chart a, chart a more equitable course forward on it. Um, but I will say, just a final thought and then I'll close, is um, it really has, you know, I've talked about how Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences sort of like blew up the mold on gifted and talented and blew up the mold to some extent on honors, right? Because we we sort of acknowledge the fact that intelligence takes many forms, right? And, and so this idea that we need to take the essence, the gestalt of G and T and honors and, and not have it siloed in a separate environment, but rather bring it into the mainstream classroom. It's the classic argument for heterogeneity of classes and the argument against tracking. Um, but they're strong conventions. They become stronger as we, as students move up into the high school level, right? So we have to sort of put a critical eye on that. But to me, this is a, this is a, a topic that as a district, clearly we need to bring heads together and chart a different course forward or understand what the course is. Um, and so you know, I'm talking myself into maybe making this a district goal for next year, but but um, certainly more more to come on that. So, Ms. Bennett, I appreciate your perspective, and uh, President Trick Scales. On that, I'll close. Thank you, Dr. Cascon, and that's a, a really perfect segue. And I I want to thank everyone who um, who called in tonight, and thank those who didn't. Um, <laughs> We really wanted to make sure that we got the message to you before the meeting tonight um, that we were restoring the courtesy busing. And so um, we are getting thank you emails. Uh, we do get some of those occasionally. And um, we're very, very grateful. Um, and as Dr. Cascone said, um, one of our board goals this year um, was to increase community involvement and to increase the input that we get from our community. And the first, as I mentioned earlier, was a town hall for budget priorities. And we didn't get the input that we needed at that time. It, it has certainly come later on um, and we'll we've learned a lot of lessons from, from town halls. And so some of you may have been with us the other night when we actually had a training on how to conduct the town hall, how to, um, 
how to set district goals. And so we really, really are interested in getting the community's input on district goals for next year. Out of that will also come um, board goals because the board has to do the work um, to assist the district in meeting the district goals. And so on June 16th, we are having a community town hall. Prior to that though, you will be asked to complete a survey and the survey will be coming out when, um, Dr. Cascone? I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting uh, to understand that there's no additional feedback coming from individuals from, 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 from which feedback was solicited. <laughs> and, um, okay. and then we'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting next week, uh, Monday, Monday or Tuesday of next week. So the board will get right on that, <laughs> board members, um, to make sure that if, if there's something that we're passionate about that we want to get in the queue um, for the survey. We've also asked um, our PTA presidents through the PTA council if they would assist us in, in pushing out the message um, from the school level that we really want involvement. And then what we plan to do on the night of the town hall is to be able to share the results of the survey and get some additional input. So please, please take the time um, to let us know what's important to you. Not as if we don't know, um, but please, please participate in the survey. We're hoping to get a very good turnout. And I wanted to mention that we had planned or we are planning to take a stab at uh, in-person meetings starting in June, if all goes well. And I keep quantifying uh, or qualifying that with if all goes well and according to plan. So that would be Monday, June 7th. And we hope to be in the auditorium. We are planning to live stream the meeting, something we've not done before. And this is part of the plan that has to go well in order for us to live stream. And we're also thinking about a system where folks can email their questions to the board in advance of the meeting so they, that they can be addressed during the meeting. But I'm asking you to please bear with us and to be, please be patient um, if it doesn't go off as, as well as we hope it does, but we are planning to move back into a more normal situation for our board meetings. And we thank everybody who was with us this evening. And I thank uh, Ms. Cohen. And so now I'd like to ask if there might be a motion for adjournment. No. So moved. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Tunnicliffe. And this week uh, I'd be happy second? to second. Uh, this week I'd be happy to second. Usually I'm okay. not in favor of this. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Rothstein. I appreciate it. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So good evening, Aye. everyone. Have a good evening, everyone. And when I end the meeting, the recording will stop and no further business will be taken. Thank you. Good night.